All right, this is the Ninja of Another Color podcast. I'm your host, D-O-T-T-L-E-Y. Today, I'm flying solo because we have a special guest. We have Matt from Nordzoic, a.k.a. Matt Nerdy, a.k.a. the what? King of the N-W-O. How you doing, Matt? I am doing awesome. How about yourself? I am fine. I'm happy to have you here. Uh, first off... This is one question I always ask to all my guests. What are you collecting? That's a good question. I actually just had to make a video on this because I didn't even know half at this point. Like it's just so all over the place. Uh so for my personal collection, it starts with, of all things, something I don't sell, and that's wrestling figures. I love old wrestling figures. Uh they sold terribly for me. I'm not a fan of working with Mattel, so I don't sell them, but I love collecting. Uh <laughs> After that is anything NECA is doing with the Turtles, uh, whether it's the cartoon, the movies. I unfortunately kind of backed myself into a corner and said, yeah, I'm going to start doing the comics, too. So now I got the Mirage stuff, got a little bit of everything. Oh. Uh, Marvel, I kind of call I don't call it a, a line. I just call it Marvel because I mix together the Mafex with the Mezco with the uh, Legends. And I really just focus on getting... Not even key. I call it the top 250-ish characters, so I don't get anybody too obscure, but I do try to get pretty much everybody one version of them. <laughs> so it keeps it easy. I, I was collecting MCU. I I ditched that. I still have it. it needs to get. I think I'm going to give it to the kids here. They love that <laughs> stuff. But like the MCU toys just don't do it for me. I just don't care. All right. For our listeners, Matt is a avid uh, collector, he owns a online store, and right now we're interviewing him to find out post COVID what his sales are like, pre COVID, what gave him the idea to start his um, store online, um, and other things. But to start, uh, where were you born, sir? I was born in Levittown, Pennsylvania, right outside of Philadelphia. Okay, and how long have you thought of, or when did you? put the idea in your head you wanted to get a toy collecting store yeah that was late that was really late in the process i always wanted to own a business i spent didn't go to college while i was one of those guys who just got college debt without actually a degree so you know you take classes don't actually get anything spent 20 years in restaurants running them made a lot of money for a lot of people me not being one of them uh, <laughs> Kind of learned really quickly, wow, I need to be the boss and own this place if I want to make the money I'm making other people. So I wanted to get into something. I didn't know what. Uh, Pre-COVID, we tried a couple things. Uh, me, me, My wife and I, that is. About eh, now 10, 10, 15 years ago, my dad and I almost opened a restaurant. Mm -hmm. Funding fell through on us. So I'm like, all right, well, that's strike one. Uh, next thing we tried was I tried doing uh, restaurant consulting. And that takes us right up to COVID. Uh, once COVID hit, I knew that business model was completely dead. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what to do. So I started making videos on toys with the sole intent being to make videos on toys and learn how to use the camera. Because uh, I didn't know how to use it. I was a good speaker for um, being a manager for so long, but not really a good public speaker. Didn't know how to edit a video, nothing. So I taught myself. And... YouTube did really, really well. And then it became, is there a way to spin this off into something? And prior to COVID, I had kind of left restaurants and went to distribution and warehousing. And I said, you know what? I think I can do this. So we took a shot, a uh, total shot in the dark. It would have been, I think, February of 2021 was when we first started getting products in. And we started off with just two toy lines. And... Yeah, we got we used the money we got from our whatever you call the the COVID money. Mm -hmm. uh, we both lost our jobs, but we were able to really cut things back and be tight so that we saved all that COVID money. And hold on one second, Anna. Hold on one second. I got a yapper. <laughs> Go ahead. Is Anna down here? And I'm trying to do an interview. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, first, we're our first dog on our interview is the first. He's, he's angry because uh, my warehouse is out here 
and we have our employee packing and he wants to go play. And my wife stacked up boxes of boxes so he can't get down the steps. So he's not happy. <laughs> she forgot I was doing this. No worries. But anyway, yeah, so COVID and then, then we got rolling and hit some lucky breaks as far as being in the right place at the right time, had the audience, and here we are. So, so COVID kind of springboarded you into getting to the, the online store. Correct. And really, one thing I've noticed is that a lot of the restaurant theory, so to speak, it translated over into collectibles, specifically toys, uh, treating everything, treating your inventory like you need to turn it over quickly, having a high velocity of turnover and treating product as if it's going to rot if you don't sell it quick enough. Because for certain brands, that that's the case. You started out as YouTube. you're a YouTuber, correct? Correct. Okay. You said that springboarded you into your toy store. When you started that... Did you have, the, not the foresight, but while you were doing it, did you see where you could springboard that into boosting sales when you're doing your uh, online store? Yeah, I honestly had no clue how it was going to go. I thought that initially I thought, you know what, let's just try this and see. I didn't know what kind of margins we were talking about. I didn't know if I was going to have the technical skills to run a website. Uh, turned out I didn't, but I was really good with Google. Uh, but yeah, that was kind of where it went. And once we started, it was off to the races. Uh, I was unemployed for quite a while during COVID. I was able to get a job again in September of 21. And I was able to leave that permanently, or at least mostly permanently in June of 22. Uh, so it went quick. I saw that the opportunity was there. Um, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Megalopolis Toys, Okay. Um, I watch your videos. Okay. So they were, I think, 2017, 2018, 2019, somewhere in there. And they were able to burst on the scene with such a force that, you know, it seemed like their sales were really strong and they just didn't know how to run a business. So my theory was, okay, the demand is there. It's just the uh, being able to actually run it. So I can do that. Mm -hmm. Uh I, and that that was that was pretty correct. Uh, Big Bad Toy Store, or not Big Bad Toy Store, Dorkside Toys. When they died, that obviously was huge for us. They were doing a lot of money in sales. It left a huge hole in the market. And we were able to step into it into a large degree. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip this question because you already said it. Okay. Who is your favorite wrestler? Oh, that's a good question. So it really kind of depends on when you ask me uh, as far as eras go. For the longest time, I think it would be whatever incarnation of Mick Foley you want to say. Mm -hmm. uh, I list, you know, I love the guy. Absolutely love them. But then, you, you know, when I was younger, it was Roddy Piper. You go back before that, it was Hogan, like every kid who grew up in the 80s. Uh moving forward some like i was never a big rock guy like i like the rock but i was never like a super fan of the rock uh but i you know i tend to enjoy the bad guys growing up outside of philly i was a huge ecw guy so the guys who never really made it big taz the sandman sabu i always loved them got to meet a lot of them uh at various times because they were so small as a regional promotion that those guys would do a lot of autograph signings just to make ends meet so I was saving up all my money to go get those autographs when I was in high school and meet these guys. So, yeah, that's definitely up there. And then there's like the usual suspects, the Ric Flair's, the Terry Funk's of the world. But, yeah, you know, if I had to put it on one person, it's probably Foley. Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that is the trivia question for our giveaway. Our giveaway next week is a massage gun. So you have to listen next week. Then you have to come back to this one if you didn't. No, the answer. The question is, who is his favorite wrestler? You have three possible answers. Three possible answers to win a massage gun. All right, thank you so much. Um, you said when we were talking earlier, you were thinking about going to a brick and mortar store. Mm -hmm. What will be the challenges of getting it to a brick and mortar store 
post COVID? So I don't look at COVID as too much of a factor in it. It really just comes down to overhead. Uh, renting out industrial garbage looking warehouse space is not expensive. Renting out anything that can remotely pass as a storefront is expensive. And in this business where you're dealing with such low margins, you have to either keep your overhead really low or be willing to really stretch prices on certain items and really don't love doing that. Uh, I like to keep things below market value for older stuff. And for new stuff, I try to be at MSRP or just a single dollar above. Uh, whereas with if I went to that model, you're looking at just alone, the retail store would need staff because it, it couldn't just be me because I run the online store too. So that's the big challenge is finding a location that financially and logistically meets the needs so that you could do it all in one place. One thing I noticed, uh, there was a little bit of a, if you follow the other stores that failed, Megalopolis had a big warehouse, and then they opened a big retail store that were not attached, and then they failed. Dorkside Toys had a warehouse, then they opened the retail store, then they failed, also not attached. The key is to get a building where you can do everything. There's some big advantages to having a retail store. Specifically, you're able to get your foot indoors with manufacturers who will not deal with you if you're just online, uh, Sideshow being the biggest among them. So it's definitely something I want to do. As far as how I do it, it's going to be very dependent on what I'm able to find. One thing I've noticed post-COVID is that a lot of commercial real estate, whatever these guys are, they're, they're more than happy to let their places sit open indefinitely uh, rather than cut the rent because they can use it, I guess, as some kind of a tax write-off instead. So, you know, rather than it's basically, it ends up being, it, it takes away their overall liability by losing money on having the building than if they did. I don't know. It's all over my head. That's why I got an accountant. But uh, <laughs> the, the uh, that, that's the thing. Like, I don't want to end up in a strip mall. Uh, our business is based on volume. So I need open space and a lot of it. And ideally I can find something where I can tack on a brick and mortar store with like, uh, you know, 1000 or 1500 square feet off in the corner of the place. And the rest of it is a shipping and storage facility. So we've been looking, like we've been looking at some really obscure outside the box ideas. Cause really the only number that matters aside from price is square footage. So ooh, of course I'm ringing. <laughs> Make sure he knows not to call me my back. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so we're looking at, uh, there's a church down the street for me. I looked at that as a possibility because uh, it's like, hey, that's a lot of square footage. And ideally, I'd like to own the place and not rent it just because overall, over the long term, it's a hell of a lot cheaper. Yeah, true. Okay. You touched on it earlier. You are a small business. Uh, do you see any issues with getting in with uh, merchandisers? You said you can't get in with a uh, slideshow. Do you have any uh, uh, setbacks or with uh, manufacturers? Yeah, there's some, uh, some more than others. So I'll kind of give you the deets on it, actually. So two weeks ago was New York Toy Fair. So I got to go and actually see and meet a lot of different people. And that mm -hmm. was incredibly helpful. Like I was able to meet the guy who's running 3-0, get an account directly with them. Same with Mondo. Uh, McFarlane, I was able to get some people on the inside so that the big thing is not so much that I can buy from them directly versus the big distributors, but mm -hmm. being able to have the information of when things are dropping so I'm not surprised, that's the, that's the real big thing. Mm -hmm. uh, Hasbro, like with Hasbro, I have an account with Hasbro, but there's like levels of account. Like I can't place pre-orders. I can only buy in stock from them. Uh, I believe the minimum is like a million, maybe two million in purchases, not sales a year. And with the way Hasbro is trending, I sure don't want to commit to anything as far as numbers go with them, because I've seen a consistent drop in Hasbro sales. Uh, other companies, like my goal is to go direct with almost every company, as long as I can meet the minimums without it becoming a burden 
So mm -hmm. like Bandai, I really I can't I might be able to meet the minimums, but I don't take the risk on it because they have a tendency to overproduce their products. Anything that is overseas only, that's usually going through a third party or just some random person that I find. But yeah, you know, some of them are just some of them are great. You know, NECA stands out as one of the best. Fun story for you. When I was in New York. There was two different days where I tried to go see the Playmates booth. So I go upstairs to one day to, to go to Playmates. And Playmates was one of the few places that they didn't have like an act. Their booth was locked and it was by appointment only. So I went up for the YouTuber section where they let all the YouTubers in. And they were like, here, here's some stuff. And you guys are great. We love you. And I talked to a guy and said, hey, I sounded like the hair club for men guy. I'm not just a YouTuber. I also own a store. And I sell none of your product but I really like to get into it just because of the turtles, but I don't want to go through a distributor. What can we talk about a direct account? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You sound like someone we definitely want to set something up with, but the guy just left, come back tomorrow and they'll tell you that we're not setting anything up, but just be a little pushy and they'll take it. I'm like, all right, cool. And this guy had a big title on his name. It was either a executive or a C-suite person. So the next day I come back, there's nobody there, but mm -hmm. this angry old lady, Oh, wow. <laughs> and she's looking down angrily at her sandwich that she had brought with her. Didn't notice I approached. So I just walked up and waited 10 seconds. And I said, lunchtime, huh? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh. And then I explained to her the night before. And she said, yeah, here, he's not here. Let me get you a card. She hands me the card to she Shepherd Distributor, which is, if you're in the business, the absolute worst distributor there is. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, this guy doesn't work for you. This is a distributor. No, he works for us. That's it. And I'm like, okay, well, I forget his name now. Bill told me that I should tell you, yeah, I still need to talk. To no, this is the person. This is the only person. And I was just like, at that point, peace. I'm out. Yep. I was so mad that when I ran into Todd McFarlane, like we were back to back with each other. Mm -hmm. I didn't have it in me to like turn around and introduce myself and say hello or anything. Just tell him how much I appreciated his work because I was in such a bad mood after that woman. That is awful. Oh, yeah, and th there's a lot of that in the business, unfortunately. You know, and some of it makes sense mm -hmm. because you have people who are like uber tiny, like they're just getting started out. They're like bushy tailed and wide eyed. I'm in the business now and I can only buy one unit. And they're like, well, we don't want to deal with you, you know, but for me, I'm not buying one unit of anything except maybe when I try a new line or it's super seven, then I only buy one because uh, nobody buys it at full price. But yeah, it's just, you know, that's kind of the name of the game. Uh, that story uh, kind of coincides with my next question. The next question is, would you, what, what advice would you give someone who's trying to start an online store? Stay out of new product. Don't even try. There's too much competition. And unless you have, a lot of money, a lot of skill in the area of marketing and or running a business and already have a built-in following from social media, it's almost a guaranteed failure unless you luck into some stuff. Instead, take your cash, start buying people's collections, start off on whatnot and sell things off via auction and eventually mm -hmm. and start building up social platforms. Once you have the platforms, do live auctions. You're going to be able to make two or three times multiples two or three times more per unit per dollar you invest than you would doing my business model um the business model of what i do online stores the nerd zoics the big bads it is 100 percent dependent on volume and if you don't have that volume you don't eat good advice good advice all right this is a kind of a left field kind of question because it's too hard um would you consider Right now, uh, no Zoic, buying collections online or, and when you get your brick and mortar store, would you take collections? Yes, to the part two, for sure. I really mm -hmm. want to get into collections. The problem with collections for me right now is our biggest issue that we run into on a daily basis is space. Our warehouse area, 100% maxed out. We also have a 20 by 20 office rented in a storage park that we use that's like racks and racks full and it's not really overstock at this point it's just that our variety is so big that mm -hmm. 
we have to stretch it out for places. So in order to buy collections, one, I have to have a full-time person just to price it. I don't have the time to do it right now, or else I'd have to find someone to replace what I do as far as the marketing and the website, which I've been trying to do, but that's harder, easier said than done. Uh, when I have a brick and mortar store, absolutely, 100%. Like I, I kind of envision being able to do a lot of uh, like Pawn Stars for toys mm -hmm. types of videos there. Like, you know, someone comes in with something really awesome. I'm going to be the guy be like, no, go back outside. Come in again. Let me turn the camera on. <laughs> okay, cool. All right. I got two more. I can have to do what you do. All right. The... The next one is, I saw your video about crowdsourcing. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about HasLab, that model of building toys? Uh, the one I'm really, one I'm really um, interested in, did you back the WWE wrestling one? Yeah, so I absolutely I have no problems with the model. I understand where people are coming from, where they have all these issues with big companies doing it. And from a certain point of view, they are correct. They do not need to get this money up front. They do not need to do this. But what it is, is it's a hedge. It's a hedge on guaranteeing locked in orders on these products. They're not going to put the big investment in. So it's really just a, a matter of reducing risk. So I don't have a problem with it. Now, that said, I do have a problem with how some of them are priced. Uh, you know, HasLab with the ghost, not the ghost, uh, the ghost rider, that car they did. That was insanity. Like, that was just stupid. Uh, but then you see other things, Super 7 with the Cat Slayer. When I saw the price on that, I thought, that's insane. Then I saw it, and I said, that's a really good price. <laughs> like, you know, you get to the point with some of these things where, yeah, it makes sense. Yes, it's a lot of money and it prices people out, but not everybody needs to be able to buy everything. And that's just kind of the name of the game. Mm -hmm. uh, we're also in changing time. You can't expect these companies to try the same business model forever. The stores don't really want them anymore. Like we're seeing, you know, Target and Walmart as an example, and I'll use Hasbro as the example because this is public information, lost tens of millions in dollars in Hasbro product in the last year and a half because they have to clearance everything out. They're not making money on these items. They're sure it is what's called a loss leader where it's going to lose you money, but it gets you people in to buy things that do make you money. But there's a limit to that. And I think we're starting to approach that to the point where, you know, they're only going to carry once again, we're going to go back to like 2018, 2019 numbers where each store gets a case. And that's okay. it. Wow. So yeah. That's really, wow. That's really going to be tight. It is. It is. Uh, and when it happens, it's going to be kind of predictable what's going to happen. You'll start hearing everyone yelling about scalpers again. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, the people, people will look at that as an opportunity to scalp, where in reality, go to a big bad toy store, go to Nerd Zoic, and you pre order it. You don't have to worry about this game, it's done. Uh, in fact, I've gotten to the point now with my pre-orders, I used to take pre-orders indefinitely because I could always just add on to my order. It was no big deal. Now, once my initial order is locked in, let's say I order 60 units of something, I yeah. set my pre-order to go off at 52 or 53, giving me some room for buffer, and that's it. Mm. Uh, once it's done, it's done. Now, I might order more later, but I don't take that risk. Uh, I, I, you know, And I think that we're going to go back to seeing everyone having to do that level of pre-ordering again, just because I see a lot of these stores, they lost too much money. And I feel it even because product that is new, I see it going out at 50% off at Target. And I'm just like, great. Thank you, Target. But, you know, the savvy collectors know that this is a game. This is a pendulum. Any day now, that's going to swing back and it's going to be, wow, I cannot, I'll never see this figure. It's never going to be in stock anywhere. And, you know, we've gotten to the point with me where, yeah, there's some products that never make it to stock. They are on pre-order. I fill the pre-orders. And then sometimes I don't have any left. And I do that on purpose. Okay. All right. I thank you so much. This has been a great interview. 
my uh, second to last question. Yeah. I, I got you on because one of my my goals is to open a toy store slash bakery. Oh, one half, nice. One half a uh, collectible store, the other half is a bakery. I got the idea. I'm still trying to do it. I'm still trying to get it done. Okay, for my last question, I saw your video about cops. Yes. Cops is a hidden gem. Who is your favorite cops character? Uh, so this is so vanilla, but I got to go with Bulletproof. Uh, I think I might have told the story of the video. I might have cut it out. I don't remember. But I didn't have a sibling until I was seven. And like two weeks before my brother was born, my mom and dad wanted to get me something special because I was going to be staying with my grandparents for a few days and they wanted me to have something. And they knew that I love these cops figures and they had never seen the bulletproof. So they started going out and it, like, this was like the OG toy hunt in 1989. Uh, it's October 89. And they went store to store, KB Toys R Us, Kitty city everywhere until they finally found me my bulletproof figure. And it remains special to me to this day. I wish I knew where the hell it went, but because of that, the character, I just absolutely love the character. Always have. Such a cool, like, I, I always, like, in my head, imagined it as, like, uh, Billy D. Williams playing that guy. Like, it's perfect. Can't go wrong with BP Vest. You never can. Can't go wrong. All right. Now, if you, like, they, of course, there's so many iconic bad guys, though. Like, uh, Rock Crusher, Louis the Plumber, they were among my favorite of the toys. Oh, yeah. They're Rock right. Crusher came in the jumpsuit. He was later on. Mm -hmm. Louis's yeah. one of the harder ones to find now from the vintage line because he was made in short supply towards the end of the line. Did they make a lot of them? I don't think they made a lot of them. No, there was probably 30 total figures, but this is back when it was so much cheaper to make them mm -hmm. that they were busting these figures out like it was nothing. <laughs> all right this has been a great interview i want to i want to have you back again a couple months later probably after i get i finish my gargoyles collection uh, yes nice. people he is the enabler that made me complete my gargoyles collection because i'm getting xanatos probably today or tomorrow then i have to get another one from big bad toy store but he is the enabler that got me my gargoyles collection complete all right folks this has been ninjas of another color i'm your host d-o-t-t-l-e-y with matt i thank you so much good night